Did you know that eBird has a course to help you make better checklists? The best part is it costs a grand total of zero dollars. Hey everyone, welcome back to the channel. My name's Hawken, this is Hawken the Lens. I've been birding for the better part of this year and I've been using eBird the whole time, so I like to think I have the basics down. But still, in today's video, I'm gonna run through the eBird Essentials course just to make sure I know everything I can about eBird to help myself and then I'm gonna share some of the learnings with you as well after I've run through the course. For those unfamiliar, eBird is a powerful online platform made by the Cornell Lab of Ornithology that helps birders and bird enthusiasts log their checklists of what they see out in the field online. For you personally as a birder, this allows you to track a life list and keep track of all of your settings that you've seen as well as share them with other people. By contributing, you also help conservation efforts all across the globe. The data is used to watch bird populations, track migration patterns, and just study bird health and conservation in general. This is a vital tool for both amateurs and professionals. It's a really cool platform that I think you should get involved with if you are interested in birding, like I imagine many of you are. All right, I'm gonna take the test now. Don't worry, I'm not gonna make you sit through the whole thing watching me take it. It says it's gonna take about three hours. I kinda doubt it'll take me that long because I've been using eBird all this year so I might skim through some of the basic basic stuff but still I'm really hoping I pick up a few new things and I'm gonna share my learnings with you at the end of the video so I got my cocktail right here I got my keyboard and stuff ready to go cue the test taking montage Let me talk to you about the course. So yes, it did not take me three hours. It probably took about 30 minutes. I did skip a few of the videos and skim some of the content that I was already pretty familiar with, but I did learn a few things. So let's share some of the highlights I found from the eBird Essentials course. So the whole first section was all about convincing you that you should be using eBird and why it's an awesome tool. I didn't need to be convinced because I already love eBird, but one thing I found was super interesting is that eBird has been referenced in 700 peer-reviewed publications. That's pretty sweet. That just goes to show how the research is being used across all kinds of conservation efforts and just publications for research in general. There's also a separate eBird for Educators course that teachers can use as they're teaching people about birding and taking their class out maybe on birding adventures. So that was pretty sweet to see too. Then the course kind of got into some of the basics, things like about their Merlin ID app, the eBird app and how to use it, how you should create a profile telling you what eBird reviewers are. eBird reviewers are volunteers in the area, usually pretty well established birders that help review all the data that gets fed into eBird. If you didn't know, in my full-time career, I'm a data analyst. And so data accuracy is quite important to me. So I'm glad eBird has these standards for their checklists being submitted. One thing I thought was super interesting is the targets feature. I hadn't known about this before. I have alerts set up that'll give me things that aren't yet on my Salt Lake County list for the Salt Lake area, but I didn't know there was this targets feature. So you can go and search a certain region for species that are very likely to show up. So for me, I could put the Salt Lake region in, set it to December, and check what species are more likely to show up that I don't yet have in my world life list. So these might be targets that I potentially wanna go look and try birding for. It also gives you a little map link to each of the species so you can see the spots where they've been reported previously. This is super sweet and I'm definitely gonna be using that in the future. I also learned a lot about sensitive species too. Essentially, if you see a sensitive species, you should still report it on your checklist in eBird, but there is built-in functionality to the platform that'll not display this publicly to people for at least a certain period of time. I don't know the specifics on how it works, but it's cool to see they're doing some measures to protect very sensitive species. But that's just a reminder for all birders, make sure you have your birding ethics at the top of your mind as you're going out to look for species. Be mindful of your location. Don't be destroying habitats. Don't be stressing birds out. We want these incredible species to live for many, many years and not to be disturbed by our presence. So try to keep ethics in your mind as you're going out and viewing birds. Another thing I knew a little bit about, but I didn't know the specifics, shorter distances and shorter durations have more value for your checklists. The recommended limit they put is five miles of travel. At certain times, you should submit a different checklist so people can more accurately tell what area you're in and how long you've been birding in that area. If you have a six hour, 20 mile checklist, people are gonna be like, where the heck did they actually see these birds if they were traveling all over the area? 
it's better to split that up into multiple checklists. And if you wanna see everything together, then you can add these checklists as part of an overall trip report. Earlier this year, I went birding with my friend Annie and then Jordan from Bright Eyed Birding. We submitted multiple checklists as we were exploring the state park of Antelope Island, and then we put them into one full trip report for Antelope Island to look at all the species we saw. Another big thing that people don't realize is you're supposed to report the unique distance you traveled. So if you do an out and back hike, out is two and a half miles, back is two and a half miles, you should not submit your checklist for five miles total. Even if the eBird mobile app is tracking that full five miles, you should only list two and a half miles. So on the mobile app, you can actually go in and edit your start and end area, or <clears throat> you can manually edit the distance yourself. Just cut it in half if it's an out and back. Another thing I learned too is the birds that you don't put on your list are almost just as important as the birds you do put onto your checklist. They were very clear throughout this whole training that you wanna do your best to submit a complete checklist. Trying to identify all the species around the area, even if you're not totally sure, they give options for like hawk species if you can't tell which specific hawk it is. Maybe you're questioning between a red tail or a ferruginous hawk. You can just put hawk species if you're really not sure. There are also some species that are very close and hard to tell apart sometimes, especially at a far distance that you can list. There's like a Western slash Clark Grebe option, I'm pretty sure. There's a Cooper's slash Sharp Shinned Hawk option. So if you're tell, trying to tell between those two specific species, there might be an option for that too. But those are just tools so you can submit that full checklist of every bird you are able to identify. When you're not submitting a species that is usually common for the area, that might be a notification that they've moved away from a migration or whatever it may be. They also stated in the eBird Essentials course that putting an X for the number of species is not helpful. Even listing an estimate of the number of species that you've seen is much more beneficial for the data that they collect. So if there's a giant flock of birds out on the water, there's just maybe a huge raft of ruddy ducks, it is much more helpful to estimate and put 700 ruddy ducks than it is to just put an X. Now, if you do submit an estimate, it's worth leaving a comment in that specific observation saying, estimate, use tens to count and estimate this group of ducks. Or, Count it about 50 and then use that rough size of the group to estimate the other groups around the area. Then another section I found really interesting was the unusual bird section. So before I mentioned that there are eBird reviewers and they review checklists that are automatically flagged to them that usually have a rare species or one of the species counts has an abnormally high amount of species that you reported. You'll often know when these are getting flagged because they shade them orange before you submit your checklist. And if you haven't yet done it already, they ask you to put comments explaining the observation to give a little aid to the reviewer. Now nothing beats getting a good photo of the bird or taking some audio and uploading it to eBird's website to aid the observation, but still comments are a very close second talking about how you ID'd the bird. They even listed that it's worth noting how you eliminated other species, that could be helpful too. So that was a new thing I'd never considered putting in my checklist before. Now these unusual bird sightings are definitely one of the more exciting encounters you get while birding because there's a reason they're unusual, it's rare, it doesn't happen often. So when you do come across these, you should be excited. Even if they get flagged for review, that's totally okay. We wanna ensure the data accuracy going into eBird is clean and good. If you wanna learn more about how eBird review works, I'm gonna link a video down in the description by Doug Hitchcox. He does an incredible job covering the whole process because he's an eBird reviewer himself and he's done it for quite some time. Really informative video that I learned a lot from there too, so check that out. But yeah, those are the main takeaways. I had some of the new learnings for me from the eBird Essentials course. Now I know the title of this video says, I took the eBird course so you don't have to. Well, I actually recommend the opposite. You should definitely take the eBird Essentials course if you haven't. You might find some learnings that I haven't mentioned here in today's video, and it's just gonna help you make a better eBird checklist and get everything you can out of the eBird website, the eBird app, and the Merlin app. It was incredibly informative and really easy to walk through, so I highly recommend it. I, of course, will put a link down in the description if you wanna check out the course for yourself. And remember, it's free, so it's hard to beat that. Hope you enjoyed this different video today. I'll check back with you soon, probably with another birding adventure here soon to make sure to subscribe for that. Thank you as always for watching, and happy birding.